thank you all for, um, along, or Pastor, for allowing me the privilege to preach this morning. Um, it's definitely something I never take lightly. I say that often, but it is very true. Anytime we get to open up the Word of God and, and share its truth, it's never something to take lightly. And uh, I, I take it very seriously, and I appreciate uh, that I get to do it. And I get to do it as often as I do get to do it. And so, um, uh, as, as I was sitting there, um, I had this thought. And, and Brother Joe, he, he, he's a wonderful singer, and, uh, and, and I'm not, nothing against him, but I said, I can't wait to get up there. I can't wait. There you go. <laughs> I can't wait to get up there. And uh, because we have, we always have these feelings and we have these thoughts, and, you know, as, a, as maybe it's a, co or, or a high school student and they're thinking, I can't wait until I get to graduate. Maybe, maybe today after church, we're celebrating a birthday. I can't wait to have some cake or, uh, you know, uh, or maybe it's an experience that's coming up or, you know, I was, I was outside yesterday and me, me and my brother were outside and, and uh, it was warmish and uh, I opened up my trunk and my golf clubs were there. He's like, you golfing today? I'm like, no, but I can't wait to golf. And, uh, you know, just waiting for that. We have these expectations of things that are coming up. And uh, let me get you a, give you a couple of I can't waits that, that people experience. Students, a lot of times, will say, I can't wait for school to be out. Can't wait for school to be out. And then teachers mirror that and they say, I can't wait for school to be out. <laughs> and, uh, well, uh, children sometimes they'll say I can't wait until I'm a teenager I can't wait until I can and then teenagers say I can't wait until I can drive I remember I got my license like three months before I turned 16 I was like I can't wait till I can actually drive on my own I can't wait you know and then maybe after that the, the teenagers will say I can't wait until I graduate and probably every single high school senior right now is like I can't wait until I graduate high school and move on with my life and those that are in college are probably like, I can't wait until I graduate college and move on. And then when they're in college, I can't wait until I get married. And then maybe I can't wait till we're expecting. And I can't wait to, till we have this child. And then we have the child. And every parent probably says, I can't wait till you learn how to clean up after yourselves. That's where, I, that's where we're at right now. <laughs> and then eventually we'll say, I can't. I just wish they would come home and make a mess again, but, uh, but that's later on down the road. But we have this ability that says, I can't wait. And that is our imagination. But, we, but our imagination can also have a little bit of a downside to it. It can cause us to have fear, worry, and anxiety. You know, fretting or, or whatever word you, you might feel comfortable using. And throughout the course of this message, I, I'm going to be using the word fear, but, but pretty much anxiety, worry, fear, fretting, all those words can be interchanged. See, fear is this strange commodity. For some people, fear or worry can run their lives, where they live in fear. And then there's some people where fear does not affect them. And it's like, you probably could use a little bit of fear. <laughs> It could probably help you a little bit. You know, we've got, and so how do we deal with this issue called fear? Because if we were to take anybody, everybody, there are probably areas of everybody's life that, that have this thing called fear in it. Whether it's a relationship, maybe it's work-wise, maybe in a particular environment, maybe it's in, in the area of health or, or whatever else. Most of us deal with fear one way or another in our lives. And while fear at times, yes, can be healthy, we, 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 and, 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 it, and it keeps us from harm, but can also rob us of God's opp of opportunity and God's blessings. It can rob us of our health, it can take away our sleep, and it can cause a lot of damage. But you see, fear is not an emotion of its own, it's a byproduct. Fear is a byproduct, and it, and, and it, and it comes from, and, if, and, and what it comes from, I don't believe any of us 
would trade the, the, the upside of imagination with the downside of fear. So while we all deal with fear, on it, it's not an emotion that comes up on its own. It is a byproduct. And this byproduct is, the, is from the ability to take in knowledge and project it into the future. We get fear because we take in knowledge and then we protect and then we project it into the future. And so, but this is also one of the greatest gifts God has ever given us. Because you take in knowledge all the time. And we always project that into the future. And so and this is what gives us hope. It's what gives us anticipation. You know, it gets us to what saying, I can't wait. You know, I, I had, I, I knew my sermon, I was sitting there and I was like, I can't wait to get up there. But it, can, it has the downside of fear. It is the ability to take in knowledge and project it into the future. And so this byproduct often gets us asking this question, what if? What if? And there is a, a, a total, there is a huge amount of what ifs. You know, we are where we are today because of this ability. Human nature is where we are today because of this ability. We are able to collect knowledge and pass it from generation to generation and then build on that knowledge to project it into the future. You know, imagine if somebody said, nobody ever said, what if we could have our phones in our pockets? Somebody had to ask that. What if, what if, we had computers or we could sit at a desk and do work and we didn't have to write everything. What if we could create this? And that's the same process that we have that creates fear. And so we would never trade that. We would never want to trade that. We would never want to get rid of ingenuity. We would never want to get rid of hope. But we have to be careful because it does have a downside. It has brought us to where we are today. It has helped us improve lives, make the world a better place. But what if is our ability to think about different situations based upon what we already know? And sometimes, as we, as we know, fear, though it can be a healthy thing, it can be harmful. And we don't want our lives to be ran by fear. And so, how can we get through this? And so Jesus here, he's, he teaches a lot on fear. And, and I love his, and, and a lot of times, a lot of times what we, what, what we do with scripture, and, and it's no one's fault, it's kind of just the way of the world, especially like in my Bible, I'll have a, a list of verses and then I'll have like a, a section, like a header where somebody tells me what's going on. It's like, I don't need that, but, but thank you. And I think a lot of times, we look at the life of Jesus and the stories of Jesus and we kind of like bookend them. Like once upon a time, story's over, moving on. Totally different story. But that's not how Jesus taught. See, these books, these three, these four books tell the entire, or tell the life ministry of Jesus Christ. And throughout this whole ministry, he's teaching something. They were not different stories. They were, it is one large story that is leading to the same end. And so, if we were to just drop in, like right here, into the story that we previously read, and we were to put Jesus' teaching on fear on the bottom shelf, we, what would we say he said? We would say, fear not. Don't be afraid. And it's like, thank you. Never realized that before. I'll just, I'll just stop doing that. That's great. But seriously, what this is saying is do not allow fear to control your life. It's not that you're not going to have fear. You're always going to have fear. And Jesus is going to teach us how to combat that. But the fear is not the issue. The fear is whether we allow it to control us or not. And so as I mentioned earlier, we all have fear but we mustn't allow it to control our lives. And so we have the first century followers here, and uh, especially the 12, and even in, in us too, we follow this. We have a hard time with this. We really do. 
You know, how many times is in Scripture, and I'm going to show you about uh, quite a few today, is Jesus telling us not to be afraid. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Fear not. Why are you afraid? Oh, ye of little faith. And this is a hard concept for the disciples to comprehend. And so, and, and, and as it said, it is for us. But they believed him. And we believe him. But we don't, and they didn't fully understand how to implement it. And so let's go to the scripture, and we're going to look at this story and, uh, and, 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 and kind of look at it. So wherever Jesus was, there was a huge crowd. See, Jesus was the entertainment of the day. You're telling me there's someone that's going to argue with the Pharisees? Hey, sign me up. I'm going to go watch. There's someone that's going to go preach in the synagogues and overthrow tables? Hey, I'm there. This is awesome. Let's go watch this. And wherever he went, news spread, and there was always a following. But within that following, there was a group of people that were a little bit more disciplined, and they followed Jesus everywhere they went. And those were the disciples. Those were the ones that were disciplined, and they followed Jesus everywhere. And within those group of disciples, there was an even smaller group that was handpicked by Jesus, the apostles. Can you imagine that? Being handpicked by Jesus. To be a part of his inner circle. And you know what? He does handpick us to have a relationship with him. And I'll get to that in a little bit, though. And so he calls, so he has these 12, and he calls them in. And he's talking to them. He's like, all right, we are going to, you know, I'm glad that you're on board. I'm glad that you're part of the team. And you know what? Here's the plan. I'm going to send you out as sheep among wolves. Now, you and me, we hear that, and, that, and, that, and that's a little colloquialism. We, we understand that. But, but, but back then, that, they experienced that. If you ever put sheep among a wolf, really what you're going to end up with is hooves and a mess. That's it. And Jesus says, all right, guys, good news. I'm going to send you out like sheep among wolves. But don't be afraid. And so, <laughs> and so sometimes, sometimes we can kind of see, or we kind of like scratch our head and think, hmm, I don't know. I don't know if this is, this is really what I signed up for. But let's get to the story, and, and, and we're going to see what Jesus was talking about. And probably, you know, they're having that meeting. All 12 of them are there. And I bet you one of them, you know, probably Thomas. He doesn't, he doesn't always listen. Not just somebody's like, did I miss something? Like, sheep among wolves, but fear not. Let's go. What is going on here? But, but. But just like in school, maybe you did this while you were in school, in order to help learn a topic, sometimes you have to go on trips. I, I, you know, there's probably been a time where uh, you were studying the state's capital, so if you were in Michigan, you got to go down to Lansing, and, and you looked, and, and you were able to see the buildings, you were able to see the courthouses, maybe you walked through, you saw all the significant documents there, and, and you thought, wow, this is a really cool thing. And then when you went back to the classroom and the teacher was teaching, you were able to connect what you saw and experience with what they were teaching. And Jesus does this with the disciples. And so in verse, chapter, in verse 23 here, we see this. And when he entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. That's what they do. They are disciples. Jesus goes, he goes. They go. Jesus says, do this, you do. And so what they did, they went out into the sea, of Galilee. Now, they weren't going across the sea the whole way. They were kind of skirmishing across to get to a particular city. And so they were fishermen. Some of these men were fishermen. They thought, okay, we're going to get in a boat. This is no big deal. We got this. And so they get in the boat, just following Jesus. Verse 24, though, says, Behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. And so suddenly a great storm arose. Now, this isn't odd actually for the Sea of Galilee because of how it's so landlocked. A lot of times storms would rise up and then they would go away. But the scripture emphasizes this one as a great storm. 
And, uh, and so they're on this boat. And sometimes our habit is to almost picture today what was going on back then. So we can sometimes think, you know, they were on this nice little 24-foot boat, and, you know, fiberglass and just kind of cruising along. No, they were on a, probably a 10-foot little boat made of wood with winds overtaking it. There's 13 people on it, and one of them sleeping on the ground, and they don't want to step on him because he's Jesus, and, 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 and there's a storm. But this storm was great. And so if you picture it, it's loud. There's waves coming over the boat. There's, there's thunder going on. They can't see a thing. They don't have flashlights. They don't know what's going on. They're freaking out. And so we see, and I already mentioned it, but what was Jesus doing? Jesus was sleeping, but he was asleep. Now to me, this, probably, this seems nearly impossible. Like I said, I explained the story, but he's Jesus, and he, he can do the impossible. I, like I said, I don't think there was a lower cabin. I, I, I'm prob probably, because of things back then, he was probably asleep on the boat and soaking wet. And just, it was a nasty scene. It was a nasty scene. The wind's blowing. It's raining sideways. They're soaking wet. The hair is in their face. No one is looking pretty. It does not look like a flannel graph we saw in Sunday school at all. It looks totally different than that. So Jesus here is sleeping. And, and, everyone, and everyone is yelling. They're yelling at each other because it's so loud. If you've ever been on a boat out of storm, it's not quiet. It is loud. And they have to yell at each other. And they're probably saying, they're yelling, you know, oh, I don't know, boat terminology. Get the water out of the boat. I don't know boat, I don't know terminology. <laughs> but they're yelling at each other. And, and, uh, and so they're trying, to, they're, they're, they're trying to figure this out. And they finally get to the point. They get to the point where they're like, I don't know what else to do. We got to wake Jesus. And so verse 25, and the disciples came to him and woke him. Now we read that. Now, it's not like how we wake up our kids. Wake up. Hey, it's time to get up and go to church. Get up. No, they're yelling, Lord, save us. We perish. Lord, save us. They're yelling at Jesus, Lord, save us. And, and, every, and there's all this confusion going on on this boat. And so they wake him. And what happens next? It's kind of funny. And he's, so he wakes up, pops up on an elbow, probably, looks at him. Mind you, they're all yelling. Why are you so fearful, O oh, ye of little faith? And they're probably like, yeah, there's hair in my face. Why are you so afraid? Yeah, we're looking for the shore. What are you, what? We are going to perish. And Jesus says, why are you so fearful, ye of little faith? And then he arose. Then he arose. He didn't get up right away. He didn't get up right away. Then he arose. And so there's this big scene of confusion. And Jesus says, why are you afraid? And the disciples are probably thinking, this is the worst question to ask right now. There is a great storm. There are, there are winds in our faces. It is, it is sideways. We are drowning. And when people drown, they are afraid. That is why we are afraid. But you see, this storm in this story, though, is not in and of itself just to show that Jesus has control over nature. Jesus does have control over nature. We know that. But here's the thing. He arose, then he got up, 
And you know what you don't see in Jesus? Jesus wasn't panicked. Your Savior doesn't panic. Your Heavenly Father doesn't panic. You know who panics? We panic. We panic. Why? Because we take in information, and based upon what we know, we predict outcomes. But God, God doesn't panic. And isn't that good to know? That God doesn't panic in our circumstances. This, I had a college professor and he said, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? God knows what you're going through. God is not panicked by your circumstances. God wants to help your circumstances. And so, and so he calms the storm. I mean, look at the verbiage there before we go on. In, in, in verse number 24, it said, there was a great tempest. And what did Jesus replace that with? A great calm. He takes the great tempest and he makes it a great calm. Look at verse 27 here. But the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? They marveled. They, and they asked the most important question ever. Who is before? Who is Jesus? That's a powerful question. They got a glimpse of who God was right there. I like what Mark said in, in, chapter, uh, in, in his account of the story in verse number four. See, Mark, Mark uh, is probably the story of Peter. Mark probably wrote it for Peter. And, 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 and it says this, And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So Mark, but, but in this, there's a little bit, different verbiage there's actually the word fear twice in the Greek in this in this sentence in the sentence and so let me try to explain that I'm explain this to you and, and so what happened is like Peter's talking to Mark and he says we were afraid and then we were really afraid like we were afraid of the storm but then we were in awe because of who we were in the boat with. And the latter fear is much greater than the former fear. See, the latter fear of the great, or the latter awe, as you could say, the, uh, their great, the greatness of being in the presence of Jesus was greater than their fear of a storm. And this is so important to grasp. And, and uh, let me put it, I, I put it this way. The, their confidence, the confidence they had in Jesus and his power overwhelmed their fear of this present world. It's not that there wasn't anything to fear. There was a storm. That's something to take note of. But there was something more important to attach to. Not the fear, but to Jesus himself. And so... The lesson was this. We don't have to let the fear control us. It doesn't have to overwhelm us. There is something much more overwhelming in our hard times. And the thing that is much more warming, overwhelming in our hard times is not the fear, but it is the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. You see, right now, there's so much turmoil in our nation. There's, there's a lot of unrest. Everywhere you look, there's negativity. People say we're so divided, and we are. And, and while that may be so, we don't have to let those things control us. We don't have to let the circumstances and the fear of the things control us. We have access to something much more powerful, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so they calm the water, and they get off, and, and they kind of go about their way. And Jesus is here teaching the disciples again a couple chapters later. And so, like I said, these stories, while they are a couple chapters apart, there's, they're connected because Jesus is still trying to get the same truth across to his disciples. And so Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 says this, Fear not, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. And so he's saying, don't fear them that kill your body. Don't be afraid of things that threaten your body but cannot kill your soul. You know, Jesus right here 
is underscoring a truth that we have been told our entire lives. And that is that there is more to you than meets the eye. There is more to you than your body. There is more to you than the you that we know and that we can see. And Jesus is saying here, don't fear them that can, do, that, that can kill the body but not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So a little bit of hyperbole there, but he's saying if you're going to fear something, fear God. Fear God. And so, and so he's going to, but, but he's going he's to kind of wrap it around a little bit, and, and he's going to bring up nature again in verse 29. And in verse 29, he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. And, and he's saying, Your father cares about nature. He's the one that created it. But that's not the most important thing. Verse 30 goes on, and he says, But the very hairs on your head are numbered, are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more valuable than many sparrows. And you are. Don't be afraid because you are worth so much more. You have an extraordinary value to God. And you do. And he knows your name. He knows the hairs on your head. That may be easier for some than others. But, but, but he knows you. And he loves you. And he thinks you are one of the most valuable things in this world. And God knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your circumstances. But not only does he know your circumstances, he cares. He knows and he cares. And see, many of us, that is the hurdle we have to get over when it comes to our fear. We go through something, and we know God knows, but we sometimes wonder, does God care? And God here is saying, look, I know everything that even goes on in nature. That's worth a penny. I know when it falls. You are much more valuable to me than that. And he knows exactly what you're going through. And so knowing that God knows what we're going through, knowing that God is there for us through our times of fear, it is enough to get us through sometimes. And even when things don't go how we want it to, and even though when, you know, at times it seems like our prayers are not being answered, he still knows, and he still cares, and he is still there. So the disciples, they're finally starting to get it. Okay, okay, I don't have to be afraid. I understand. You're, you're with us. You're all powerful. You know us. You care for us. You love us. Okay, we're getting this. And so Jesus takes them on another trip. And this time it goes pretty well. They're going out, and they are there, and Jesus is going out, and they're teaching. Uh, Jesus is teaching, and he's healing people, and there's a mob of people again. And, uh, and, and so they're going through, and things are going good. And, and, and he's teaching, and, and it's getting pretty late. And it's getting so late that actually the disciples come to him and say, Hey, Jesus, you need to send them away because they're going to they're gonna faint from not eating. They're going to have a hard time. And Jesus says, I have an idea. You feed them. <laughs> you feed them. And they're like, they're like, do you understand how much money that would cost? That would, that would, there's not even enough food in this region to do that. Seriously, send them away. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. And so we know, we know this story, and, and I paraphrase it a little bit, but Jesus gets the, the lunch from the little boy, or the, or the loaves and the fishes. He prays over it and distributes it, gives it to the disciples, and the disciples then go out, and they have this food. And they're able to feed 5,000 people. And they're able to actually pick up some scraps at the end. 12 baskets worth. And, you know, probably Matthew, he was probably writing this and like, I don't know how to explain it, guys, but we did a miracle. It was pretty sweet. <laughs> we did it. Jesus did it through us. And so we see, so probably, so at this time, their, their expectation, their excitement is at an all-time high. They, they, 
they, they just saw Jesus perform a miracle through them. And look at what Jesus did immediately. And straightway, Jesus constrained them, constrained his disciples to get into a ship. He says, don't even, I will send them away. You go on a boat. And you see the, the word there, constrained? That means to force. That means to force against their will. What do you mean? You just did a, Jesus did a miracle through you. But they remember the last boat ride. And they're like, we don't want to do that. We will walk. Thank you, but no thank you. We get it. We don't have to fear. And the best way of not fearing is by not getting on that boat. Excellent. No. And he forces them on this boat. And he forces them on the boat. And then he sends, and then he sends everyone away. He constrained them. You know, this reminds me of, of a story of Annie Lou. I don't know if you ever heard of Annie Lou. I, I heard it's a true story right on the internet, so it's got to be true. So, due to, due, to not, due to certain circumstances, Annie Lou never got married. And Annie Lou was in her 90s, and so what she ended up doing is living with her uh, sister and, and her husband, Walter. And, and they lived together throughout their entire adult life, and Walter and Sally had three kids of their own. And Andy Lou was there the whole time. But at the age of 94, Andy Lou, start, uh, Sally passed. And so Andy Lou, and Andy Lou was starting to, to lose her mental facilities a little bit. And, uh, and so they were trying to figure out a, and trying to figure out a way to, to get her into like an assisted living complex. And Andy Lou didn't want to go. And so they decided to have a family meeting and Walter's there and and the three daughters are there, and they're all talking and trying to figure out a way to get Annie Lou into this assisted living complex. And so they're, they're kind of joking around a little bit. And, and, uh, and so one of them says, you know what? I know, we know she has memory problems. We could just say, hey, Annie Lou, let's go out to lunch. Grab your purse. Grab a couple things. We'll have the room set up, and then we can just drop her off there and tell her that's where she lives. She won't know the difference. And they're kind of giggling about it. And the three daughters keep on talking. Then Walter, Walter chirps up. He says, I'll tell you this, ladies. And they're like, what? If you ask me out to lunch, I'm not going. <laughs> I know what your plan is. And I think the disciples are kind of like that. Jesus, we know what your plan is. We know that something's going to go on. We don't want to take that step right now. And so Jesus constrains them to get on the boat. You know, some of these men were even fishermen. And he says, I will meet you on the other side. So Jesus promised that they were going to get over. He says, I'll meet you on the other side. And, and, as, and as the story goes, you want to hit it? And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went, oh, I forgot about the storm. And so while they're out there, of course, the winds are harsh. And, uh, and so they're young men, they're young and they're strong and they're rowing. They're just rowing and they're getting nowhere. They can't see, once again, they can't see shore. They're rowing and rowing, just rowing against the wind and, and, and they can't figure this out. And then, and then in the fourth watch of the night or shortly before daylight, shortly before daylight, they see Jesus walking on the water. And they go, hallelujah, we're saved. They say, it is a spirit, it is a ghost, we are all going to die again. When they were troubled, they failed again, and it happens. And so here, here's what, you know, I love that about scripture. Like, when these letters were written, they were still alive. They were still ministering in that area. Matthew was still known as a follower of Jesus when these letters were written. And so normally when somebody writes a letter about themselves or a story about themselves, if there's something embarrassing, they're going to leave that out. But these disciples, they're like, no. Matthew's writing it down. Like, yeah, that actually happened. We we're all afraid, screaming like girls. It's terrible. Peter, Peter, you are a fisherman. I don't want to talk about it. Just write it. Just write it. They had the fear still. And you see, but 
uh, in, in verse 26, we see that up there. It's what happened. But let's look at verse 27. As long as Jesus is there, there was no need to fear. Straightway, immediately, Jesus spake unto them and said, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. When Jesus is here, there is no need to fear. The presence of the Lord was all that they needed to overwhelm their circumstances. The presence of the Lord was all that they needed. And actually, Peter actually realized that. He said, if it's you, let me walk. And he actually was able to walk. Because he saw Jesus and he said, I'm going to take my, my emotions and take them out of my circumstance and give them to you, Jesus. And let me walk. And he was able to walk. Now, people want to give Peter a hard time to say, well, he looked away. Well, how many steps have you taken on water? You know, Peter actually walked on water, so that's good stuff. He put his faith in Jesus. And so, and he was able to do that. And he realized it was Christ. He trusted him. And he was able to act beyond his fear and not allow his circumstances to control him. But, just like in our lives, it didn't stick. The truth didn't stick with them. And they had a hard time. And, and they would deal with this throughout the entire earthly ministry of Jesus. And now we're going to jump to the end real quick. And at the end of Jesus' ministry, they're on their way to Jerusalem. The disciples were thinking, you know what? This is it. Time for the Messiah to take over. Time for Israel to be under the leadership of Jesus. Things are finally looking around. Lazarus just got raised from the dead. We walk into town. Everybody is chanting his name. They are saying Hosanna. And, and they, they're there. And they're waiting for this change. And they spend about a week in Jerusalem. And then finally, it comes over to one last Passover dinner. And Jesus is teaching. And he says he's going to be starting a new covenant brand new relationship between man and God. Brand new relationship. And through his earthly ministry, he started a brand new movement. And that's called the church, and we are experiencing that today. One that has promised to have victory over the gates of hell. Perpetual victory. Nothing is going to stop it. And the disciples are thinking, this is it. Finally, it's going to to happen. And later that night, Jesus gets arrested. What do they do? They panic. They lie. They deny. They run. They thought it's all over. Everything we've known was wrong. They crucified him. They beat them. They killed them. Everything we thought we knew, we were wrong. Everything we experienced, it was a farce. It might have been exciting, but nobody is going to believe us. He made, when he was teaching, he talked of himself, and so that anything we have to say will lose validity because Rome can't crucify God's Messiah. God can't, Rome can't kill God, but that's what happened. And so they thought it was over. But then, Peter and John came upon an empty tomb. And suddenly, they met their friend. They met their living Savior. And everything that Jesus said was punctuated. And they were back in business. Their covenant was back. Jesus had changed the game again. The resurrection punctuated every single thing that Jesus taught. We do not have to live in fear, for he has overcome that fear. They had a new level of, of power and relation because of the resurrection. But that same thing that same power, that same comfort, that same resting place is available to me and you because of the resurrection. Because he did say that he was God and he did say that he was going to die and that he was going to come back and he did it. And so we get to rest in him. 
Finally, the lesson of the boat ride was understood. When Jesus is near, we have nothing to fear. Now at this time, there was a, there was a historian about, and, uh, and, and he wrote this of Christians after the, after the resurrection. He was a doctor, and, and, uh, and so he says, it seemed as if they had lost all fear of losing their life. And when that fear is gone, nothing can stop them, or nothing can stop a man. And that is true. They no longer had anything to fear. They physically experienced the resurrection. Now, in our lives, we were not there. We did not see Jesus empty tomb. Now, you can see it, but we were not there. And so, sometimes we may see, like, well, if I didn't experience, how can I still rest in it? But we have a more sure word of prophecy, and that is the word of God. And he says you can rest in that. You can run to that. You can run to that relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, there are things in our life that are fearful. Yes, there are things in our lives that we do not like. And being afraid is a part of the human life. It's something we cannot avoid because we have that ability to predict the future. But we don't have to let it control or dictate our actions. To finish, Peter, who failed both boat rides, failed them both, failed, failed, failed Jesus also after he was taken, who after he met Jesus, after the got right with Jesus and spent some time with him and got that relationship, he wrote a letter to Christians abroad. And he says this, Cast, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. you we, we have these issues. We have these fears. We have these doubts. We have to. If we want to not let them control our lives, we have to take them and cast them on Jesus. We cannot control them ourselves. I cannot control what's going to happen later on. I cannot control, you cannot control the future events. All we can do, if we don't want to be controlled by fear, is take those cares and take those fears and say, Jesus, they're in your hands. Why? Because he cares. And he loves you. And he's there. And not only that, he says he will work through that. Peter is saying from an, from an experience, as an eyewitness, take all your worry, take all your care, and cast it upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He will take that fear, he will take that fretting, he will take that doubt, and he will replace it. He will give you what you need to get through. It may not be the funnest time. Being on a ship in the middle of a storm is not fun. But he got them through. And God will get through. You have to take that care and cast it upon him and allow him to lead you forward. So we take the fear that we have. We realize that, it, that, that we have something stronger and greater, and that is Jesus. Jesus can overcome anything. Jesus can right any wrong. We, to not be controlled, must take that care, take that fear, and cast it upon him and allow him to work. The disciples, Jesus, wake up. Calm the storm. Got him through. Jesus, we're rowing all night and we can't get through. Jesus got him to the other side. Jesus will get you through. Cast your care upon him.